are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fire University. Today, I have an old lab member back to talk about a study that uh, I think is really exciting. We've just gotten it published, and I've gotten quite a few questions about this. So today, I have Mariah Bogus here, and uh, he's currently the state deer project leader for North Carolina. So thanks for coming on the show, Mariah. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I, I'm excited to have you here. I think the the story behind some of your master's research with me is really interesting since you did come to to work on fire and deer with me and then we ended up uh getting a string of some something like 700 burn days in a row that we couldn't burn on or something or 700 days in a row with that are no burn days i don't know something ridiculous but uh, you brought the rain with you when you came so uh we ended up coming up with some pretty cool projects that you worked on. And, and uh, now we get to talk about this one you've just gotten published uh, about how fire or exposure to fire affects wildlife preference for acorns. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that study and, you know, what, what, why, why do we even care about that? You know, just what did you do and why do we care? Yeah, so, boy, we did a lot of stuff. I think touching back on, <laughs> on what you you brought up there, the burn days, um, one interesting part of this project was the treatment for our burned acorns. We couldn't even do that out in the forest. There was that wet even in February and March in Mississippi, which is the time you should, you should start mm-hmm. getting burn days. Um, to be able to burn acorns, I actually had to collect leaf litter and then dry it indoors just to get the the moisture out of it long enough because it was raining outside and then i I actually acclimated it to the to the ambient temperature and moisture and and we burned Um, yeah yeah we had pretty much every wrench thrown at us but we still made it happen so yeah well you know something interesting about that it it may have already struck some of the listeners uh, because i i know based on feedback that i get that there are plenty of them that that don't even think about burning an oak stands like when you say a prescribed fire we're just thinking about the piney woods or or fields or whatever and and uh we don't really think about particularly our upland oak forests i don't think a lot of people are thinking of that as being somewhere we would use yeah fire. so i mean I, I think that's well of course it's short-sighted and and maybe a little bit more focused um or we, we're a little bit too focused on some forests over others so for instance, like longleaf, the longleaf pine forests, there's a lot of, of information out there and a lot of talk about burning in those forests. But what do you find in longleaf pine forests? You find pockets of upland oaks, usually black jack oak, blue jack oak, and turkey oak, mm-hmm. which are also fire adapted species that you find growing on well-managed properties, uh, you know, interspersed um, within longleaf forests. Mm-hmm. So the, the fire and oak connection is readily available if you just look for it, just just past your pines. Um, mm-hmm. Moving into the Appalachians, of course, the upland hardwood forests found there, and even the central hardwoods um, would have normally received fire, and that's how those forests regenerated. That's why we have as many oaks as we do today. And um, you know, I, I think that the biggest reason we don't connect fire with oaks is obviously we're we're not seeing a lot of fire in the oaks right now. Um, and that hasn't 
really played out yet. We haven't seen a large decline, at least noticeably to our eyes, of oaks disappearing just because they're mm-hmm. such a long-lived species. Um, yeah. Of course, once you get down on your hands and knees and start studying what's actually going on in the forest, it'll make you, your hair stand up thinking about what is regenerating and what isn't. And spoiler yeah. alert, it's not oaks. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's an issue. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's, that is an issue and it's something that I have worked on and you've been involved with a lot of work related to this topic. And I don't think people understand that we have a lot of dominant oaks, like you said, they're overstory oaks and these these oak forests throughout the Appalachian and Southern or uh, Central Hardwoods regions. And, uh, you know, we think of them being healthy and doing fine, but there's actually a bottleneck in regeneration, which has been identified now uh, by many researchers. And I've been a part of a group that, that has done some work on that. And the prevailing hypothesis uh, is that the bottleneck is at least in part a result of of fire suppression. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a really important point. And it, you were you got to help, I think, in, in another study that we did at the same time that kind of highlighted this point where we collected a bunch of leaves from all these different species and look, looked at the leaf traits, leaf traits, you know, like what, how they were shaped and how they curled and dried and all this stuff and found that a suite of our oaks in the upland hardwood system actually promote fire they, you know they uh, they burn really well so they you know that's a showing you traits that promote fire progressing through that system so um, now that we've kind of highlighted that that fire apparently has played an important role and probably still does in upland oak forest what about burning in the fall yeah so that's that kind of creates a a little bit of an issue for anyone who's who's trying to regenerate oak at least at least at surface value because we think well um of course the next generation of oak trees are those little acorns falling off of the tree in the fall and there's been mm-hmm. numerous research projects before ours who have identified that fire indeed does damage those seeds being those acorns laying on the ground mm-hmm. and it drives down the germination rate of those acorns and so some of the takeaways of of those projects um, and of course intuitively is that maybe burning in the fall wouldn't be such a great idea if you're killing the seed of the trees that you're trying to promote uh, so yeah. it kind of creates this little bit of a a little bit of a complex for a prescribed fire manager you know of, of an upland forest because you want to use fire fall is a great time to use fire especially when you're in mississippi and this seems like it rains every single day of the year if you're only two days that are are good <laughs> come in October or November, are you just not going to burn those days because well, you might kill some acorns? Yeah. It, you always also have the problem in the Southeastern Conference, at least, that uh, your Saturdays are pretty much tied up, either with deer hunting or football or both uh, during that time. So that that makes it a little more challenging. But yeah, I think uh, another point to add to what you're saying is we're – we just got through talking about how important fire is, even in our oak systems. And one of the ways that we can improve that is to add more fire, but we're limited by burn days. So one of the ways that we can expand the burn window is to start burning at other times of the year, like the fall. And it turns out some previous work has shown definitively that the majority of good burn days that we get where fire could be, you could pull a permit safely and and a lot of prescribed fire and do that is in the fall. And that is the least utilized part of the window in the South in particular. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity, but just like you said, that face value, we, we like to think of things as being really clean, clear cut, dry. And, uh, of course, if you have a bunch of acorns fall on the ground and then you burn over them, we're going to kill some of those acorns. And we inherently think that's going to be bad for oak regeneration. But maybe not, right? It's kind right. of assuming that the only effects that matter are direct effects of exposure. Yeah. So what are some what are some other things that could happen? Yeah. So th- this is honestly one of the funnest things about forest ecology is it's so multifaceted because you're dealing with a you're dealing with a plant community that has an overstory, midstory. You have saplings, you have the herbaceous community, and then you have all the animals mm-hmm. within it. 
Um, so effects of a fire, what do we know happens? Well, you burn off all the duff, the leaf litter. So mm -hmm. that's one effect. Um, that's of course the fuel that's burning. Um, that's what's burning up those acorns. So there's an immediate reduction in the fluff on the forest floor, which can be cover for small rodents um, such as mice. And then of course you burn up any herbaceous vegetation on the ground, or at least you, you top kill it or at least wither it back. And so there's an immediate reduction in cover. Um, and then of course there's nothing on the ground that could hide those acorns and they're pretty much the only thing left after a, a real good prescribed fire. So those are other effects of, of this fire that we talked about at the beginning of this project is that uh, we know that fire affects acorns, but we also know that it has other effects on the system. And I just covered those, the reductions in fuel. Mm -hmm. Then the other big question mark is, well, what does it do to the predators of those acorns, those seed predators? Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets really interesting. It starts to make its own gravy because if you think about it, what I just talked about, all that fuel we're burning, affects the animals that would then eat acorns. And it affects some yeah. of them positively and some negatively. Yeah. Well, it... <clears throat> Some of the things that, that were really exciting and interesting, I guess, to me when when we embarked on this project, and we'll get, I promise folks, we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of the, the particular study that we want to, but uh, there's so many, so many fun things to talk about, uh, and I think it's good background. So we've done, a my lab, you included, have done a lot of work to show that fire can really affect the behavior of a lot of things that eat acorns like deer and turkeys and squirrels and everything. So we may have a strong attraction to those burned areas. That's pretty typical for most species. Uh, another thing that was really interesting that you said, and it, it stimulated me to think through our conversations, particularly during your defense. And I'm curious if you remember these conversations where it, it really is at face value. It seems like, okay, you directly kill a lot of pose a lot of them right and then they're visually very easy to see when they're laying around with no duff covering them and uh do you remember our conversation related to that uh, as to whether or not they're actually more vulnerable i tried to block out my whole defense you know <laughs> <laughs> no no uh well, there's i, I mean, used there's... an analogy with you and i think it i thought that it turned on the light bulb but we'll see if you come back with it well, this has been years ago, folks, by the way. <laughs> so, so on the subject, there's so much that comes to mind because this is something I've mulled over um, since. And that is yeah. the multiple effects of prescribed fire, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is just one of them is, is does it expose those acorns to more um, predation? Are they getting eaten more? Yeah. Um, you know, if I had to guess... I'm just going out on a limb here anecdotally. I would say it probably increases deer consumption of those acorns because they're probably yeah. more easy to find. Um, but that's fully, I mean, that, it's not supported. I have no data to support that. So uh, I, I don't remember the specifics of our conversation. Yeah. In my defense, well, I gave you the analogy of burnt toast. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I led in with that. And one of the things, you know, we immediately see, okay, these acorns are laying around on the ground. Some of them are dead. But if I gave you a piece of toast that I have burnt to a crisp, are you going to eat it? Now, see, I won't, but I know people who would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends on how hungry you are, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, the whole point, and that was the point during your defense, is that it actually it may make them more vulnerable because they're visible or, and it probably differs by species and even how hungry those species are even, uh, but it also may conceal them or make them less preferred because you've charred them and now they taste like ash and, you know, some things may not like charred acorns uh, or it may make them taste better because we cook our food, right? Mm -hmm. So now we've got cooked acorns. Those might be really good. Uh, but the other thing is, we know at least for squirrels, if you, if you, have you ever planted an acorn in a pot trying to grow an oak tree? Yeah, I sure Thanks have. Through the, yeah, I, I know that some of the listeners have. I have done this 
countless times now. If you put an acorn in a pot and then put it outside where there are squirrels, what's going to happen to it? It's probably going to get gone. Yeah, the squirrel's going to get the acorn. At least that happens to me all the time. Maybe I just have smarter squirrels, but even if it's in a place like, you know, I could have pots sitting out there with soil in it that don't have any acorns in it for years where we have multiple generations of squirrels turn over. And then I go put an acorn in it and next week acorns will be gone. They're going to rob it. And uh, that's always something that stuck into my head. And I actually did a, a an experiment. So it was like a pseudo experiment during my PhD work along these lines where I was actually going out and burying acorns in the yard where we could see them from our office. And uh, it was kind of cool because squirrels were coming back and getting the acorns. So I'm thinking, are they watching us in the trees? But the reality <laughs> is when you go and look in the literature, they have this keen sense of smell and they use that to rob caches from each other. So when I say yeah. cache, I just mean a squirrel goes and buries an acorn. So all of that, I'm basically telling this elaborate story to say that the other thing that has happened when you burn these acorns is you have potentially concealed them from one of their main seed predator squirrels and seed cacher as well, uh, because you may make them smell like everything else. Everything smells burnt, or you may uh, you may actually have the scent absorbed because there's so much charcoal around and we put charcoal and things to absorb scent all the time right so there are lots the whole point is there are all kinds of things going on in the system that are really cool and uh because of that we we have lots of things to research but we also have to do things in particular ways to try to isolate the variables of interest so now i think I think we're ready to go to your experiment. We have that context. So what did you do in your experiment to try to isolate uh, the variable of interest? So we got started first with the acorns. Um, had to keep them in refrigeration, of course, until we burned them. Um, had what kind it, of acorns was it? Yeah, eight species. So I had four upland species and four more bottom one species so in the upland mm -hmm. category we had black oak scarlet oak northern red oak and southern red oak and in the bottom one category um, willow oak schumard oak nut all oak and cherry bark oak um mm. so i got those all collected we so pretty broad suite of species yeah pretty broad um most of those you know they, they're found across the southeast and and they can this is one interesting thing if you if you walk through the woods from a bottomland to an upland site there's no nice clean line where one species disappears and another appears I mean, it, there's exceptions to that i mean sometimes that happens mm -hmm. but there's a wide gradient um where those those species occur from bottomland to upland um, so there's a little bit of a, a blurry line there between those two categories but we wanted to have species across the um, just kind of across the range of fire adaptedness. So we chose those eight. And I mentioned this earlier, we had to collect a whole bunch of leaf litter. Picture, I think it was four or five 55 gallon trash bags I collected of leaf litter. We took it back to an <laughs> old lab building uh, there at Mississippi State that no one was using. Cool. And I, it was a concrete floor and I just dumped it all out. See, there's this room that looked like well, the forest on the inside. Yeah. Well, a lot of folks are just thinking about raking up leaf litter, I'm, I'm guessing, in the yard or something. It's like, oh, well, that's not that many bags. You can do that in a few hours. But what else did you have to do? Well, I had to first had to get it. Yeah, I had to, to first identify a stand where I could get it. Um, I had to collect it out of the woods so it wasn't just like off of a clean lawn. Um, yeah. Once we got it back in the lab, we had to control the temperature enough because it wasn't a used building. We had to do it, control it at least enough that it could dry out. Then I had to get it all collected back into the bags to take out in the field. And, and I did clean up my mess behind me. So that was also another job <laughs> clean up that room. Uh, Cause it, yeah. it or not, wasn't made for drying out leaf litter. We no. took all this out into the field and, and we burned it um, over five different fire plots. So we set out acorns and marked them by species, um, shook them down just into the top of the leaf litter so that they would be uh, yeah. in the leaf litter strata, approximately the location they would be in fall when a prescribed fire would occur and then burned it 
pretty much as simple as that yeah. and then pick, picked up the acorns. I think you then you you even had to calculate how much leaf litter was falling approximately right and then yep you yep. basically had to weigh the leaf litter and recreate how much would fall out of the trees onto the ground and where would the acorns be relative to that biomass it, it was really I, I guess uh kind of giving people a peek in the, the folks that wonder i know the plenty do because they ask me what i do all the time uh wonder what's going on behind the scenes and some of this research we're trying to pay attention to these little details like that they could make a big difference right if you put a, a giant pile of leaves there that's probably going to have a bigger effect on the acorns than the amount that's falling out of the tree likewise if you don't put enough to carry the fire across that that's going to have a different effect on the acorns so we were trying to simulate i guess what i'm saying simulate what is happening in nature yeah yeah that's a good point we we had to measure the, the leaf litter then we also put out fire pyrometers. They're, they're basically just pieces of metal with tape that, or sorry, with paint that melts at different temperatures mm -hmm. to monitor the fire, um, the fire temperature across those plots and even the resonance yeah. time to make sure that our fires weren't um, substantially hotter or, you know, or they weren't too weak to, to not get a, a treatment effect on the acorn. So there was a lot of mm -hmm. care that went into it to make yeah. sure that that because of all of the because basically taking that leaf litter indoors was taking it out of its environment suddenly mm -hmm. we're not in the natural system then we had to measure all these other factors to make sure that when we put it back yeah. out um that it that we were using a fire that was representative of what a yeah. manager would use well and, and uh i think this is a, a good place to talk about this is one of one of the points of an experiment is to take things out of the natural environment so that you can control confounding issues. So we've just talked about all these different things that could happen, right, in a forest ecosystem. If we just went out and burned an, an area and then followed acorns, there would be all kinds of things going on that we're observing, and we don't really know what is responsible for what. But in your scenario, you did it in that specific way because you wanted to isolate the effect of the acorn being exposed to fire on wildlife preference without all the con confounding issues that are changing the fact that you know changing all the vegetation structure and everything affects the behavior of the animals we wanted to get rid of all that variation so when you talk about i, I hear it talked about from both ways the experiment is not a natural system well it's by design not uh, for some specific reasons and that's not a problem it's in many cases a strength we want to mimic the things that are variables of interest with nature and then isolate those from other factors that are not of interest which is where the non the the uh i guess the uh mesocosm you know, isolation part of it comes in. So it's yeah. an important point, I think, for people. Yeah, it's a good point because, you know, we could have we could have taken one stand, thrown out acorns in there, watched them, taken another one, burned it, put out acorns before the burn, and then monitor what happened to those acorns. But all we would know, essentially, is what happened to acorns in those two spots. We wouldn't know if it was a change in because of the, of the change in the, the, the litter on the ground from the fire, yeah. if it was the plant community, if it was that maybe there was just a you know, a bunch of squirrels that like this particular block over the other one. And mm -hmm. that's why there were squirrels all over one and not the other. There would be so many, yeah. so many of those factors. That we would just have yeah. to guess. And, and that's not what science is. We need to measure. Right. Well, and uh, so what were you specifically trying to measure? Yeah. So I, I should describe that exactly what my question is, or, or it was. The question was when acorns are exposed to fire, does that change the rate at which they're removed by predators? And we took that question a step further by, by asking it in the context of predators who cache and predators who do not cache. So just to explain that a little bit, a predator who does not cache, a white-tailed deer is a great example. When a deer comes across an acorn, it's not picking it up to go bury it somewhere. The deer's eating that acorn, and that acorn doesn't have a chance of surviving any longer because it's now dead it's, it's in the gut of mm -hmm. that deer if a gray squirrel for instance comes and picks up that acorn and runs off with it 
he may bury that acorn. He would cache that acorn um, to be consumed later. Now, squirrels and, and other cachers like, like chipmunks and, and mice, they do consume most of the acorns they cache, but there is some percentage of those acorns that survive, um, that the, the animal never goes back to eat later. So in spring, that acorn would germinate. And there's actually quite a bit of data out there to support the, the statement that being removed from the, the top of the leaf litter and being cached actually improves an acorn's chance of successfully producing a seedling because it's now mm -hmm. in the soil, exposed to moisture. And as long as that rodent doesn't come back and eat it, um, or another one find it like like you pointed out, then yeah. we're good to go and that tree's going to grow. So we wanted to split our question up and, and look at it a couple different ways. Ultimately, to get to to to, to satisfy our curiosity of well, does burning change the rate at which these acorns are removed and therefore improve or decrease the chance of that acorn being able to produce a seedling in the future mm -hmm. when it's burned or not burned? Yeah, and just to highlight some of this because it's such a complex issue and um, I'm thinking through what, were, what are the things I would wonder about based on what you just said. You know, the, like a squirrel, we'll just say regular old gray squirrel, you said that they actually eat the majority of acorns they've come in contact with, right? So they are caching a lot of acorns, but but they're eating a lot of those. They're not store. They're just storing them for later, essentially. And they come back to a lot of them, not all of them, but also some of them get stolen by other squirrels or other rodents. Uh, and some of them go bad or whatever. And even with all of that, it's still beneficial for the Oaks perspective to sacrifice a lot of the seeds so that a few of them get cached and forgotten because those few that get cached and forgotten perform so disproportionately much better that it overwhelms from a fitness standpoint the, and long-term fitness of a population, it overwhelms all of those other negative effects, which is sort of like what we were talking about with the, the burning being exposed, you know, the acorns being exposed to fire, that kills a lot of acorns. But if it changes what happens to all the ones that didn't, in a particularly favorable way, that might actually still be a net gain for the oak. And here's an example how that could happen, just for the listeners. Uh, it's not related to Mariah's study, but it was one of the reasons we did this study that way. Uh, there were some other studies that have demonstrated very well that if, a, if you burn in the fall and an acorn then gets cached in that burned area, that seed performs way better than a seed that gets cached in an unburned area, you know, the analogous scenario where it hasn't been burned, the seed that gets cached there does not perform as well. So they, you know, some research has shown that because of the changes in the nutrients and competition and uh, light conditions and all those different things in that burned area, the seed getting cached in it actually fares very well if it doesn't get killed by exposure. So that's sort of the opposite of what you did, though. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oaks, they just play the numbers game. If In a good yeah. mast year, they're producing one tree, producing three, 5,000 seeds. They just need a, one or two of those to survive to be successful, really just one to be successful. Yeah. So it's, it's purely a numbers yeah. game, and it's about producing a quality seedling that will survive. Yeah, that's a good point. So you, all right, you've gone to uh, the part of the study where you collected these acorns, you put them in a plot, and you burned them, exposed them to fire. So now what did you do? So next thing, um, we were working in two different study sites. They're about 30 miles apart. And across those two different study sites, we selected 20 locations uh, for plots um, in upland hardwood forests. And half those plots were randomly assigned burned acorns, and the other plots received unburned ac acorns. Each one of these plots consisted of nine trays, and these were circular disc trays, about eight inches across. And in the bottom of each tray, we placed sand so that it wasn't just a plastic bottom. 
So now picture a grid array of, of nine circular trays filled with sand. So three across and three down. They were placed each about six inches apart in this grid. And then they were, they were all placed out on the hardwood leaf litter. And above the plots up in a tree was placed a, a trail camera overlooking these trays. Yeah. And uh, if you remember earlier, I said we had eight species of oaks. And for each plot, whether they, these were going to be burned acorns or unburned acorns, all species were added to, to, to the plot. So one tray would be for one species, one tray for another. So um, out of those nine, you had eight with acorns in them, and then there was one tray that was left empty because we didn't have a ninth species. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, of course, we randomly assigned the location of each species in each plot so that there wouldn't be any selection based on being on the edge or being in the center of the plot. Mm -hmm. um, so each plot was set up a little bit differently. And then that camera was placed uh, way up in the air, around 10 feet up in the air, looking down so that we could observe whatever came to remove acorns. Those cameras triggered uh, when an animal came, and then we had it set on video so that we could count the acorns as they were removed, watch animals remove them. And then we also had that camera set to trigger every hour so that we could take a census of the acorns and just make sure that none had been removed without a trigger from the camera, which actually did happen. Um, more than likely from smaller predators that, that don't always trigger a camera consistently. So then we observed the plots for up to 20 days, and then we had a whole bunch of data to go through. And that was simply yeah. just sit down at a computer and for each plot go through um, and count acorns endlessly as they were removed by plots, recording <laughs> times, what removed yeah. them, getting all that data recorded um, yeah. all, across all 20 plots. The, and, the not so fun part. Yeah. <laughs> data yeah. Well, there's, it was actually pretty cool uh, what all came to the plots. And, oh, uh, yeah, you know, we had yeah. a bobcat come and visit, several turkeys, some deer. Uh, we had a gray fox come and eat acorns and, and take those away. And so there were some pro some surprising things. Um, mm -hmm. They were really I remember fun. You had, you had some videos of a little vole that was like rooting around under the leaf litter and come up and grab acorns off of some of the trays. So. Yeah. He would, he would just <laughs> pop up, you know, he would, he would just pop up out yeah. of the leaf litter, grab an acorn and shoot down underneath it. And then he would just disappear. Which yeah. again, it's, it's funny. It's cool. Cause you spend a lot of time in the woods. You don't see all this stuff, but when, yeah, a camera Not, like I said, down, in the, I mean, how often do you sit in the fall in an Oak stand and, you know, just observing nature and uh, there's still stuff that we were seeing on that camera that I, I don't see. I do that all the time in the yeah. fall. I know you do. Yeah. And uh, a lot of those things I've just never seen. It, it was pretty cool. It was a really cool study design, too. Clever way to use cameras. Uh, obviously, that was somewhat artificial because you had the acorns on trays, but that allowed us to see them easier. Uh, also, uh, one, I don't remember if you said it or not, but another element that was intentionally uh, a little bit different than uh, would have been in nature as you put all of them in unburned forest because we were trying to control for the effects of, of uh, you know, all the things going on with the fire, in, you know, in nature. We're trying to control for all those count confounding effects. So, right. uh, yeah, so, you know, you bring that up the plot specifically being unnatural. That was by design. We wanted each acorn, whether it was burned or unburned, mm -hmm. to have the same odds or same chance of being detected by a predator, a seed predator. And then we also mm -hmm. wanted, um, yeah, those being in unburned forests, we wanted that to be consistent across treatments. Again, we're trying to get this project as far removed from all the other effects of fire like the burning of the leaf litter and the understory um, that can change animal use of a stand and solely mm -hmm. focus on what's happening to an acorn you know, chemically, physically, that changes whether an animal wants to eat it or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's a, a really important aspect of the study 
Uh, and for those of you that are wondering, what does this actually look like? We're going to put a, a couple of videos online showing you the design and showing you animals actually coming in and, and recovering acorns from these different things. So uh, we'll put that online. Also, we'll have some links to the papers, uh, some of these papers we've discussed, if you're interested in some, some heavy scientific reading, uh, happy to provide those. But OK, well, let's quit beating around the bush. What, uh, what happened? Like, what did you, what are some take home points when you, you've exposed all these acres to fire, at least half of them, and then you've observed how it affected selection by the community of things that eat acorns, what actually happened? So at the end of the day, the burned acorns on average took longer to be consumed than the unburned acorns. So okay. that is, by the end of the study, so we had a very limited amount of acorns, about 1,800 acorns in this, in this project. By the end of it, they were pretty much all removed. However, we looked at the, the amount of time it took for each acorn to be removed. So you had basically a mm -hmm. probability of removal that increased over time, and the slope of that increase was much slower for burned acorns so that yeah. they would survive longer in these plots. No. An important aspect of that that may not be immediately obvious is that's kind of the strategy of oaks, right? They kind of, they synchronize their mass production. People have probably heard that before. They're mass seeding, that's what that means. So they're, they're going all in, all together at once, producing a whole bunch of mass to slow down the removal of acorns. This is thought to just satiate the predators, right? So that's sort of what you're saying that fire helped do right it, it slowed down the removal of acorns right yeah because so these were all red oak species um and there's no yeah. there's no certain time when when animals just say oh hey i'm done eating these acorns mm -hmm. and gonna let them sit till spring and they germinate they're always just kind of playing the odds of surviving long enough to be able to grow into a tree so while the acorns in our project were removed by the end of it by by a sea predator What's important is that it took longer because the longer it takes for those acorns to be removed, the more likely that when there's a mast year, which is exactly what you were saying, yeah. Marcus, it, it, there's, it's more likely that there, there will be survivors uh, for that spring yeah. germination. Yeah. So that's, that's one important thing. But, but just like we said, it's more complex than that. If we also look at different uh, predators in the community, they responded quite differently, right? To, the, to being burned right yeah so there was of course remember we had the, the, these classifications cashers and non-cashers mm -hmm. and i'm just going to walk through these species real quick i already broke it down yeah. with some examples for non-cashers our two main non-cashers were deer and raccoons mm -hmm. now there were a couple others that were were poorly represented like wild turkey you know the gray fox i mentioned opossums that only took Wait, a don't, few don't acorns. say that they were don't say they were poorly represented. They just didn't, weren't detected very much. It's okay. hard for me to admit that a turkey in any circumstance is poorly represented. Well, I went through the video <laughs> and I would say you. they were poorly represented. <laughs> yeah. um, they just weren't detected very much. Yeah, most most yeah. of our pictures were not turkeys. There we go. We can but. safely say that. <laughs> and that was the yeah. non-cachers. In the cacher category, there was a lot of gray squirrels, southern flying squirrels, fox squirrels, and then uh, a couple of different m mice um, and bull species. Yeah. And so that pretty much breaks down those two different categories. Um, but importantly, yeah, if we look at them as either a cacher or non-cacher, burned acorns um, had a, a higher probability of being eaten um, by the, the non-cachers than the cachers. So mm -hmm. in, in other words, once they were burned, it was more likely that those non-cachers like deer and raccoons Raccoons specifically did a lot of this, would seek out those, those burned acorns. Yeah. And, and we talked about this before. Interestingly enough, if we look at deer, uh, deer consumption of acorns, almost every single acorn that was eaten by a deer in this project was, it, it was a deer eating a burned acorn, with the exception of just yeah. a handful. Yeah, that, it was overwhelmingly, that, like of all the stuff in the 1,800 acorns or whatever you put out, 900 of them have burned, 900 or not, roughly. 
I, I forget what the actual numbers are, but something like that. And only a few were eaten uh, of the unburned category when deer had access to both. They were. So what about the one thing you didn't say? Was there any preference for the species of acorn? Like, did you see any? Like, did, was there a preference among the different red oak species, or uh, did the fire shift that at all? So the shift in survival time, or, or I guess the reduction in removal rate when it, when acorns were burned versus unburned was pretty uniform across all the different species. And I looked at yeah. this, you know. Several different ways. Um, looked at it sideways, looked Man, at it front ways, back ways, and yeah. there, there wasn't we, a lot of a lot of. I hard remember data squinting. There. <laughs> yeah, I remember squinting. I was like, "Wait a minute, there's yeah. not any selection between these species." Yeah, they they for red oaks across the these eight species at least. That's what I remember as well as thinking, "Wow, they really just said, were eating all of them." Yeah. It, they, it, there didn't seem to be a, a preference for any of the wildlife species for for any of the acorns species. Incredibly yeah, striking. Incredibly too, to that point, you think about northern red oaks to willow oaks, there's a huge difference in the size of those acorns. Mm -hmm. um, you think about a, an oak like scarlet oak or southern red oak compared to, to, to nut all oak or schumard oak, they have uh, very different adaptations to fire. So that we had a wide range of, of oak species here. And yeah, at the bottom line was for all of these, they were less likely to be consumed when they were burned. Um, and then if we trying to get at selection, there just, there was simply wasn't enough data to get at selection by a certain seed predator species, mm -hmm. to get it, get at selection of, of different acorn species. Yeah. Well, to kind of, I guess, think about that a different way. Where the, so you said that deer and uh, maybe another species really liked burned acorns. Were there any that avoided the burned ones and, and only ate the unburned? There was one. Or, or were, you know, the, really? Yeah. Who's yeah. the culprit? The, the culprit is those pesky old fox squirrels. <laughs> so, fox squirrels. Interesting. Yeah. The, the, the interesting thing here is that, um, in our sites, we had both gray squirrels and fox squirrels that would show up. Um, so there mm -hmm. wasn't any real difference between site characteristics because both species were showing up there um, across yeah. the sites. However, the gray squirrels, they ate burned and unburned acorns. In fact, gray squirrels kind of seemed to favor the unburned if we just look at the, the totals. But when you look mm -hmm. at fox squirrels, they did not eat one burned acorn. They, they, they just, I guess, they Isn't avoided that something? them. And yeah. when I think of the, the if we were going to break the squirrels into fire squirrels or not fire squirrels, I would think of the the fox squirrels being a fire squirrel. You know, yeah. they uh, are prevalent across a lot of our open pine systems that burn all the time. And uh, they didn't eat any of the, the charred acorns. That's that's pretty well. And, and uh, you know, again, the southern flying squirrels, they only ate burned acorns. So, yeah. Uh, you know, again, the, the squirrels, were, they were a very mixed bag. And the interesting thing, you know, when we talk about this, we're talking about n net positive or, or, or net positive or negative effects to mm -hmm. acorn survival by looking at these different predators eating these acorns. And it's obvious, at least from this data on these study sites, that these different species, at least these certain species, had some selection for burned or unburned acorns. Yeah, of course, the presence of those species or at least the population density of those species is going to vary by site. It, I mean, it may mm -hmm. even vary within site, depending on how large the property is. Um, so it's, you know, it's very obvious that if there are if there are negative effects of of, let's say, deer selecting to eat these burned acorns um, on the site, if you're in an area with a lower deer population, that's not going to be as much of a factor. Um, and it may be the other mm -hmm. side where your unburned acorns are just getting hammered by the fox squirrels. Uh, but on a yeah. particular site, if you burn there, there's there's no gray squirrels to be eating those acorns. They're they're suddenly surviving mm -hmm. longer. So I guess what I'm getting yeah. at is there, there's probably a very mixed bag of effects depending on the sweetest species using that stand before and after fire. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, another thing is you're we're all all everything has been from the perspective of the oak. We're presenting it as good or bad based on that perspective. But the alternative to that is if you're a deer hunter and you burn a stand in the fall and there's a bunch of burn acorns around, deer are gonna get in there and eat those acorns, right? And raccoons and gray squirrels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there you go. The mixed bag of game right there. <laughs> yeah. But if you're a fox squirrel hunter. You know, you might be needing yeah. to hunt next door. Yeah, that's so crazy. Well, I, I think it, this was a really cool study and fun to talk about. And, and it lets us highlight burning in a system that it's not typically thought of, uh, at least for most most of our uh, listeners, I think. So that that's fun. And I think, it, yeah, uh, it's a really cool, really fun way to study how all these things work. Hopefully people will get some real value out of the information, even if it's just to understand that things are really complex. Do you have any take-home messages that, that uh, people can take from this? Yeah. Um, we, we mentioned this before earlier. So we have been talking about whether it's good or bad at, at the acorn level. But, you know, at the end of the day, the distribution of, let's just say, fox squirrels, I don't know about anyone else out there, but if you sat, sat on different deer stands, you've noticed in this one spot, there's squirrels everywhere. In this other one, there's just not as many squirrels. Likewise with deer, if you really put in your homework, you can find where there's concentrations of deer using different parts of your property. My point with this is even the use of these different species is a patchwork across a property, yeah. especially if, if the property's managed well. And you could burn... You know, you could burn a hundred acres and the effects for the acorns underneath different trees across that site is probably going to vary from tree to tree, or at least, you know, every couple acres to every couple acres, because mm -hmm. the, the predator species that would eat those acorns, uh, the, the sweetest species there and, and the amount of them is going to be different for every tree. So at the end of the day, getting fire on the ground promotes heterogeneity. It's, mm -hmm. it's bringing out those effects that those predators have by either making them select more or select less those acorns. So I would say bottom line, if you're concerned that this, you know, in this project, we primarily detected deer eating the burned acorns. Don't let that deter you from burning because what you're if you doing, want to regenerate up. right. What but, you're doing but, is promoting heterogeneity, yeah. heterogeneity. You know, that's, that's, but, that's my yeah. takeaway from it. Well, and if you're a deer hunter and you want deer to be more attracted to the acorns, then let that be a primer to get you setting more fire. And maybe pick Especially your favorite during that fall. Pick your favorite <laughs> oak stand that's producing really well one fall. You're going to sit anyway. Go ahead and burn it. And yeah, sit tight you and grab your gun. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good stuff. Well, uh, Ryan, if, if people have follow up questions, where can they find you? Um. I guess on Instagram at Mariah underscore biologist. Uh, okay. I'll spell that because that's not intuitive. To, it's M O R I A H underscore biologist. Um, All right. Well, and we'll uh, we'll link you in and uh, the UF Deer Lab and uh, at Doctor Disturbance accounts on Instagram. So, uh, yeah, if people have follow up questions, I encourage you to reach out to Mariah. Is very knowledgeable, obviously, about this subject and. And I would be more than happy to talk to you about it. But in the meantime, I hope uh, everything's been going well for you, Mariah, your new gig there in North Carolina. And uh, it's sure been fun talking to you. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Well, I appreciate any chance I get to talk to Dr. Disturbance. It's a, <laughs> a chance well taken. So I, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on, Marcus. And it's always fun to revisit a topic like this. Yeah. And thanks, everybody out there for listening. Uh, we really enjoyed bringing you the show. Fire University is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.